Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. We're back again with an incredible guest again, uh, Margaret Kimberly, who has participated in the Unity 4J vigils a, a few times, but I've never had the pleasure of uh, interviewing directly. Mm. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you for joining us. I, thank I'm, you. So, I'm sorry that it's under the, the, the circumstances that it is, but I, I, and because of that, I guess the first thing I'd ask you is uh, what, you know, to comment on the recent developments uh, as far as Ecuador and WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and his potential expulsion from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Well, it's, it's all very scary, but it's also mysterious. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it looked, you know, when the, that plane from the Department of Justice landed in London, um, and they cut off uh, Mrs. Assange's Twitter, it looked like they were going to try to snatch him. And these uh, statements and then denials of the statements from the Ecuadorians, and that seems to be the complication. And I, I think the Ecuadorians haven't decided what they want to do. And I, I think also one thing in Julian's favor, it, it would be, it's gonna be complicated to do. Uh, he's in a, he's not in a remote location. He's in the middle of London. People know where he is. The media are there. Supporters are there. And it's going to be, it's going to be a dicey thing for them to pull off. And I think that's what has helped them. So I get the feeling there has been vacillation on the part of the Ecuadorians, uh, the scandal involving the president, the infighting uh, in their government. I think has kept them from uh, making a decision, a decision, of course, that we don't want to see. Um, but it's, um, but it is, it's, it's frightening, it's disturbing, nonetheless. And I wanted, I haven't been on for a while, I, but I definitely wanted to try to, to be on uh, this evening to, uh, to talk about this, uh, this situation. No, and it's fantastic to see, you know, a journalist, a, a senior, you know, journalist like yourself actually speaking up on behalf of and in support of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. That's, you know, one of those topics we were just discussing in the last segment, which is the fact that so many in the press don't, and not only do they not support this, the one of the most effective uh, journalistic organizations ever, they actively engage in a propaganda war against them. So. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's very, uh, it's unfortunate this, this, I, I call it the PSYOP has been so successful. Um, this has been going on now for nearly three years. Uh, the Democratic Party using WikiLeaks uh, as their excuse for having lost to Donald Trump, uh, blaming Julian Assange for um, what we're told is a hack, and but now the all the evidence shows was a leak. Um, but we have a media here in the United States which is uh, on the side of the, um, of the establishment, the, the elites. And, um, and so they want to do, first of all, they want to get Julian. They're still very angry with him that he was able to reveal, um, going back to 2010, the revelations about the Iraq war, the role he played in revealing the duplicity of the Democratic Party and their corruption which led to Trump winning, which is why they want to blame him. They certainly, they don't want to take responsibility for what they do, but we have been uh, subjected to three years of lies. Um, anyone who has a counter narrative has been excluded. When I tell people that uh, the DNC emails were leaked and not hacked, people look at me like I'm crazy because they've literally never heard this. Even people who, think of themselves as being well-informed, who read the paper every day, watch the news every day. Actually, they're, uh, I think Mark Twain said, if you, don't, if you don't read the news, you're uninformed, but if you do, you're misinformed. And that, that's definitely true uh, more than 100 years later uh, in uh, this uh, Russiagate story, this, um, this, this hoax, this psyop that has been uh, uh, used by very powerful people uh, to make uh, to make things happen and to escape culpability for their own crimes. It is Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party who involved foreign intelligence services in the campaign. Everything from hiring Christopher Steele, which, by the way, as Joe Loria pointed out a few days ago, which began before they knew they um, had their uh, emails missing. 
So, um, but this is a continuation of, of these very big lies that uh, powerful people need to see continue. And the fact that the uh, Mueller report has absolved Donald Trump of uh, the charge of colluding with the Russian government um, means that they actually are going to double down on everything else. And I think in, in a weird way that has um, increased the danger for Julian because the report is not saying that Russia was not involved. They're still saying Russia interfered. They're still blaming uh, WikiLeaks. And during this uh, investigation, they could have talked to Julian, but they didn't want to because they know he's telling the truth about not getting uh, the material from the Russian government. And uh, so they have actually more of a reason to want to make an example of him. And as far as people not speaking uh, up for him, they, you know, we have a media and so many people are complicit and um, people who should have, the people who used to defend him. But uh, now that he's been tied to Trump's victory, there are people who ought to know better, who I think we just had a bit of a connection issue, maybe on my end, but uh, is anybody else having a problem uh, hearing Margaret? Hearing his situation, oh. wanting, you're frozen. Oh, there you are again. There you are. Yeah, I don't know whose connection went bad for a second, but yeah. it's good now, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Please continue. Yeah, so so we so we have this terrible situation where the journalists who should be speaking up for uh, the freedom of the press. Americans always talk about we have a free media, we have a free press. Well, we don't. We have um, a media that goes along with uh, powerful people and with their agendas. And uh, someone like Julian, who they ought to be rallying around. They have um, many of them have played a role in denouncing him, and uh, it's uh, it's very sad to see. But I I think that makes it all the more important for uh, for us who've uh, been a part of this effort to continue to speak up. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I think that it is really saddening to see that no matter how you know, despite the efforts of uh, people like yourself to speak up. You know, so many people exist in an echo chamber where they only are fed information by establishment media and cable news, you know, uh, hosts like Rachel Maddow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I think you're, you are, I think you're really correct when you say that, you know, the, the absolution of, of Donald Trump on the collusion issue has not dealt with the DNC hacking narrative, the, the Russian hacking narrative, hasn't dealt with the issue of hack versus leak when it comes to WikiLeaks. And I believe the summary of the Mueller report uh, basically still uh, uh, restated that narrative that, that Russia hacked the DNC, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, what, what do you see going forward? Uh, what, you know, whether Assange is expelled or not, what do you see in, in the near term future um, as far as WikiLeaks and you know, the, the response of the press to something that though they have been completely complicit in the, in the uh, persecution of Assange, you know, that this really could have disastrous effects for their own self-interest. Do you think you'll, there will be any sort of wake-up call for them it at all? Could be. I, I think just out of their own self-interest, I think there will be some people who ideologically have uh, turned against Julian, who realized the implications of him being charged under the Espionage, Espionage Act, of him being put on trial. Um, I think um, uh, the, that's why the Obama administration chose not to charge him. They called it the New York Times problem, meaning their friends, the people they want to, what is convenient for them, they want to feed information to people. So. They saw the problem, uh, but the Trump administration obviously does not feel the uh, same way. So, uh, but hopefully, I, I think there are people, and there have been people who, you know, they feel the need to denounce him and then say, but it's a bad precedent, so I don't think he should be charged. So I suppose we, you know, we should be grateful for that, you know, backhanded help. Um, I think Chelsea Manning, uh, her situation, I, I think may uh, help the case. We have, you know, some people speaking up for her. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez spoke up for her. 
was kind of a, you know, I call it a half-assed defense. It, uh, she said she shouldn't be in uh, solitary confinement. And, and I'm, I'm glad, and apparently she's, she is no longer in solitary confinement, but, you know, she did not speak to the issue of uh, the fact that this grand jury has, is in, uh, still in session at all, the fact that she was called, the fact that she has been, uh, um, did the smart thing and agreed not to testify and implicate herself. And now her attorneys say that it's obvious she's been spied on for some time, that she's been under surveillance and they're trying to get her into a perjury trap. So that is a start. And so that means there's a possibility of people actually speaking uh, to the issue of um, uh, this uh, uh, grand jury uh, indictment of uh, Assange and the treatment of uh, Chelsea. Absolutely. It is such a uh, backhanded, uh, you know, response. Mm -hmm. It's a positive response, but it doesn't address, it doesn't address that fundamental issue that these are truth tellers and journalists covering and, um, you know, facilitating the work, the work of truth tellers that are being prosecuted, just like John Kiriakou, who, you, you know, we will probably speak to at some point during the vigil, uh, having been prosecuted as far as the, you know, CIA torture program that he reveals, but none of the perpetrators were prosecuted. Yeah. over and over again and that that's what it seems to me that Ocasio-Cortez and others who have, have supported in that kind of tepid way that's the fundamental truth that they avoid um you know do you see at, at least you know in the uh, independent I, would, I don't want to say alternative press but in the independent media that is non-corporate and not essentially state-backed do you think that there is recognition of that fact that issue Oh, yes, I think so. I think, um, uh, I guess everybody has an echo chamber and, a, and, and, yeah. a bubble. and in ours, we're, we're on the same page, but, you know, you have to leave your bubble sometimes. I was, a, a few hours ago, I was uh, on Twitter and I was reading Edward Snowden's tweet and people said the most vicious things about him, about Julian. They're like, oh, so do you like Russia or not? People making snide remarks that he's a Russian spy and Julian's a rapist, and um, it was it was kind of it was sad to see, and it's a reminder um, that there are so many people who uh, some of them have not been exposed to the information. Uh, some may be, some are just cynical. There's all kinds of things, but I, I in general I think it's sad that you you have to be a detective and you have to look and look and look and look for different sources in order to find out information that is um, demonstrably true. Um, but when uh, the newspapers and you know, MSNBC and CNN, when they all keep telling the same lies oh, for now for three years, it's very, it can be difficult. People have to have very open minds to even hear uh, what we have to say. But the independent media, I think definitely there is a, um, you know, all the people who've been on all these vi vigils for the past year um, are representative of uh, organizations and, um, and outlets that uh, uh, have this point of view that allows us to um, uh, not to be swayed by uh, the information that's the misinformation that's repeated over and over. So yeah, that is, like but breaking through is, uh, is, is tough. That's, I can't lie about that. Yeah, no, I, I feel very frustrated when I, um, you know, speak to people in my local area that consider themselves liberal, but as you say, as you describe, they have that rabid hatred of Julian Assange of, mm -hmm. you know, and tie him in with uh, Donald Trump and Russia and all of the rest. And I, I don't know, and especially returning to the, uh, what, what you described on the Twitter feed and the in the replies to the tweets that Edward Snowden had posted, uh, I don't know whether to call that you know uh, the actual bots on social media that are created mm -hmm. to do that, to create a sense of a false consensus against these truth tellers, or if it's evidence of the success of this propaganda war against WikiLeaks and truth tellers like Edward Snowden. Um, either way, it's yeah. not. It's I'm, not sure, a great I'm sure it's some of both. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I think we have, we don't have a choice but to keep doing what we're doing. And I think whenever we speak, we win other people over. I, last night I was uh, 
uh, speaking at an event here. I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C., and one of the organizations I'm involved with, Black Alliance for Peace. There's been a week of um, anti-NATO uh, actions in Washington, and uh, the week ended with the Black Alliance for Peace event last night. And before I started my prepared remarks, I, I said that, um, you know, this news had uh, just uh, been announced that there was a possibility that they were uh, again threatening um, to snatch Julian. And of course it was a friendly crowd and people gasped and people were sad and, um, but, uh, it, but it's something that we, we must connect and we must connect with so many different things. Uh, um, all of my uh, political affiliations, we are well aware of the dangers of the surveillance state. Um, but that's one of the ways in which the script has been flipped and uh, people attack Trump from the right. Uh, people who ordinarily, now they're, you know, they're talking up the FBI and the CIA and supposedly liberal outlets have this guy, Brennan, who, you know, his involvement with the day that Russiagate that we find out everything that happened will be a happy day. It's a huge scandal. It's much bigger than people realize. The involvement of Hillary Clinton and with people like him, it's, um, it's very deep. But um, I think eventually it will come out. I'm going to be hopeful that this will come out and that uh, Julian will be uh, exonerated. But it's very important that he stay out of the America's hands because once he does, and you mentioned John Kiriakou, he's spoken very eloquently about his own experience and uh, what this uh, Eastern District in Virginia does to people. It's a hanging court. And um, their goal is going to be to get him and convict him and uh, um, to make sure even if he had good defense, and I know he does, has a, uh, good defense attorneys to um, make sure that they can't pre present what would be helpful to him. So we, uh, we cannot, we must do everything in our power to keep him from falling into the hands of the US government. That would be a disaster. Absolutely, and in and strangling Assange's voice, it's just inevitable that it's the same, it's essentially uh, strangling the First Amendment. And I think that, or one of the things I wanted to ask you was how, I mean, we talk about the echo chambers that we have in, in our social circles that are um, aware of these things, but how do you think that uh, the people that are watching um, who are not journalists, who, who don't have that type of voice, how can they raise their voices in support of Julian Assange WikiLeaks or, or other methods that they could uh, show um, you know, solidarity? If you have any thoughts on that. Sure, I think, um... You know, this, the, the fact that the Mueller investigation is over has, there's one good thing, um, uh, the narrative is now called into question. And so there are, I think there are more open minds. It was, it was interesting that uh, Rachel Maddow's ratings are down. So <laughs> that one made good me thing. happy. So uh, I think there is an opening here for people uh, to be willing to hear something new. And I think we have, it's, it's, it goes both ways, social media, they can cut people off, but then when you have the chance to speak, we have to use it. And you have to go out into the public and out into the streets. And if you're not used to doing it, it can be uncomfortable at first, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. And uh, the next thing you know, you're you know marching down the street chanting with other people and other people stop and say, what are you doing? And what, what's going on with this? Um, uh, the, you know, we can write letters to the editors. You don't, I, the New York Times actually shocked me. They printed something I said about their coverage of Venezuela. It was about Venezuela, which is so biased. And, and I said, can you find anybody who will defend the Maduro government? Can, you know, can possibly get someone with a different point of view? And they actually printed it. They haven't changed what they presented, but they actually did print it. So I think we do have to be optimistic in, um, uh, doing every everything that we can. So when uh, I, I responded to Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and I said what I just said, I said, well, this is a good start, but you need to say a lot more about Assange and about this situation, about the fact that there's a, a grand jury against him. And uh, so we need to use every opening that we can. 
Absolutely, no question. Um, and a number of the guests that we've had on uh, earlier tonight have discussed the fact that, uh, you know, obviously we haven't seen Assange expelled at this point. Uh, but do you think that not just this vigil, but the overall backlash and public reaction to the announcement by WikiLeaks that sources had told them that Assange would be expelled imminently very, in a very short term, uh, do you think that that leak of that information has pr maybe prevented his expulsion or? Yeah, I think so. The, you know, the, the worst thing that can happen is if he uh, doesn't get attention. If uh, there aren't people in front of the embassy, they, you know, uh, they may figure out a way to do it. Um, so the more attention it gets, I'll be, so the media start to pay attention. So all now the press are out are outside the embassy and more um, ordinary people are outside the embassy. So um, I think it's a, a very good thing that um, uh, WikiLeaks uh, uh, gave us that information. And it does show that there are people paying attention. It does show they're nervous about grabbing him. And that's a good thing. That's a very absolutely good. yeah, and I think that it was also revealed by WikiLeaks uh, that there was this plan where the UK was going to act first, and Ecuador was basically going to say that oh well, we're not going to kill. They're not. We've mm -hmm. gotten concessions that they won't kill him, so therefore mm -hmm. we're allowing this to happen, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say that would probably add to uh, the the kind of spotlight on Ecuador and the UK, and maybe possibly preventing that exact. Uh, kind of game plan to go into effect since it's already been exposed. And, you know, the bad pub publicity that would come from, um, you know, dragging Assange out of the embassy, you know, because if this, if WikiLeaks had not uh, got, had access to that information and tweeted about it, you know, they very well could have had minimal press coverage and very few people raising their voices and those eyes on the embassy for that event to take place. So hopefully, you know, this has at least made them reconsider uh, that action. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's interesting. You never know why something does happen or doesn't happen. I've, I've, right. I've also wondered about Brexit and this ongoing crisis of the UK government. And I've wondered if that perhaps has um, uh, postponed or has stopped them from, you know, they're already had the eyes of the world on them in a negative way. So it's probably not the best time to do something which, um, may bring uh, criticism and disrepute on them. So I've, I've wondered about that too, if that has, um, has uh, played a, a role in, uh, in their uh, not um, um, making this move just yet. But I was, uh, uh, some friends of mine were recently in Venezuela and they were telling me that there are people, there are thousands of people who just take turns and they stand outside the presidential residence to make sure that Maduro isn't attacked. And wow. um, it's, it was very um, inspiring. And that's the kind of thing that, uh, that Julian uh, needs to, to have happen, uh, that people feel uh, strongly enough to be witnesses and uh, to make it as difficult as, um, as possible uh, for, for them to get their, uh, their hands on him. So, um, so those are the things people need to do. If I were in London, you know, I can't, you know, for, for a brief moment, it's like, can I go to London, <laughs> which I can't right now? Um, but it's a big city, right? Aren't there millions of people there? So there should be um, uh, hopefully an organization on the ground who can coordinate this and make, because the last thing that we'd want to see is a lull and, you know, people pay attention today and tomorrow, but don't pay attention next week. And, uh, you know, drop their guard and um, he's un, uh, undefended. So um, yeah. I, I hope that there are people making those plans so that uh, uh, he always has that protection, always has those eyes on him. I know that there are, there's Wise Up Action, which is one of the groups that is, has been a long-term, um, you know, vigil group. They're not there for uh, 24 hours a day, but they have been there for years and years uh, holding vigils and organizing them. Uh, but I completely agree that it would be a huge shame if the eyes of the world left the Ecuadorian embassy and that's when this uh, you know, horrible thing were to occur. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that um, hopefully this has at least prevented it somewhat, but you know, we yeah. just don't know. I, I was just wondering, are there any religious groups, any faith-based groups who, who would 
um, take this on. And it's a funny thing. I, I think in general, uh, people are less religious, but there's some, there's still some power when the clergy uh, speak up and uh, uh, about the morality or immorality of uh, official decisions. People do pay attention and politicians do not want to be seen uh, as going against some religious teaching. And I, I have no idea, this is something that just occurred to me, is there someone who, who will speak up, someone um, uh, prominent, and I'm, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's just something that occurred to me. Uh, yeah. If from a uh, from a religious point of view, spoke up on Julian's behalf. That is something that that people will still pay attention to. So I I, I don't know if there's anyone uh, who could do that. We have actually had the participation of uh, Father Dave, who is an, a very anti-war uh, Christian figure, and he so he's participated in vigils previously. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get him on again. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think there is a small amount of there are a small amount of of uh, Christian and other um, you know religions which have that anti-war population that would see mm -hmm. Assange and WikiLeaks's work as so important for that anti-war. Um, kind of movement. I know that uh, Kieran O'Reilly, who is somebody that's on the ground at the embassy uh, almost 24-7, is a, is a member of the Catholic worker movement. So I think there is a, a, a kernel of that religious activism uh, mm -hmm. involved in, in the support for Assange and WikiLeaks. Uh, but going back to what you said about the thousands of people in Venezuela forming almost a human shield mm -hmm. uh, for, for President Maduro there, uh, you know, I think the fact that you know, you see that and you also see the, the what, 20 plus weeks, I believe, or is it 18 weeks of the Yellow Vest uh, protests mm -hmm. in France yeah. continuing. And I think that that amount of, of participation shows um, anti the anti-imperialist and anti-plutocratic sentiment. And I think that the fact that that number of people or that level of energy is not showing up at the embassy is a direct reflection of the level of the propaganda that has been used and weaponized against Assange. And I think that's that's the major thing that we, especially you and I as, as independent journalists, have to just continually wage war against in order to bring those people uh, in support physically to the grounds at the embassy. But. Yes, yes, it is. It, and. Um... I, you know, I was just thinking of, um, I don't know if there are people who could be appealed to, people who uh, have uh, um, that reputation, that, are, that respect from the public. I just, I just had this vision of religious leaders standing in front of the embassy or, uh, I don't know. I, I, I was just uh, uh, thinking about that. There, there seems to be, um, uh, Obviously, the propaganda has succeeded. I think the Brexit crisis, um, I, I think people are, how can you not, if you're in the UK, focus on that. Uh, but um, I don't know. I was, just, I was just trying to think of something different, something that had, had not happened um, before to try to, to, um, to move public opinion uh, in in favor of uh, of defending Assange and defending uh, Chelsea Manning, uh, but we have to keep doing what we're doing. And um, I don't know if Ocasio Cortez saw. I I was noticing many people shared my opinion. I was very happy to see that there were people were not satisfied with uh, you know with her her half-assed uh, comment. Um, but and we can't be, I, I, you know, part of me says that's a good start. And the other part of me says, I'm not impressed. We, you know, we, this is not the time for half measures. And um, uh, I, I discovered that when people do push politicians, you can push them out of their comfort zone and uh, uh, force them to talk about things in a way they don't want to, if they, um, uh, if they feel enough heat. Absolutely. No, and I think that, um, and I was just uh, checking on, on some individual names of other representatives and former politicians who have spoken out, you know, for WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange. I know that recently Tulsi Gabbard made a, a less um, ha uh, backhanded, a, a much more positive uh, mm. uh, statement on the, the impact that WikiLeaks has had and, and basically a statement of support. We've also had uh, former senators like Mike Gravel who have uh, support, come out and support strongly of Chelsea Manning and WikiLeaks, which is just 
really helpful, but it maybe does not, I guess, have the um, the public um, maybe audience that somebody like Acacia Cortez does in the sense that she has been given so much media attention in the last year or so. But those are at least some steps in the right direction from um, current and former representatives. So. Yeah, and in the United States, it's very important for people uh, like Tulsi Gabbard to um, to be presidential candidate. She's a long shot as a uh, president, but the fact that she uh, is running for office does bring attention to uh, issues that she has, um, where she's staked out a position uh, against, um, she's a mixed bag, but in general, she's now speaking out against the US intervention. She's speaking out against a lot of things. And uh, there's something about a presidential candidate raising these issues that um, uh, brings more attention and gives a little more weight, a little more gravitas to, um, uh, to issues that people ordinarily would not think about. So uh, I think with prodding from us, we can, we can, move, we can move these people into the right direction and uh, get them to really um, uh, get them into the position that they should be in. It's always the pressure. They, you know, it's, all, it's never voluntary. Every, when, they, when they get something right, it's because they've been uh, forced to by uh, popular demand. Absolutely, and, and it kind of is a reinforcing cycle because people like Tulsi, like Ocasio Cortez, even if even with a half-handed, uh, uh, sorry, a half-hearted statement of support, it still may, especially for the followers and commenters on Ocasio Cortez's statement, it may crack a small amount of light into that propagandized worldview and just start the process of possibly you know awakening some minds to the to the reality that that truth tellers face in the u.s but yeah i think it's really sad that uh that the essentially a lot a large segment of the quote-unquote left has been now supportive of the u.s deep state of the cia of the fbi and all of these elements can you maybe just comment on the the detriment of that not only to wikileaks and julian assange but to the country as a whole and the implications of it of, uh, I'm sorry, I was a little distracted. I was looking at what Susie's yeah. saying. Okay. She says, yeah. we have won, you won't be kicked out. So. Yeah, that was actually announced um, earlier today. We've discussed that earlier, I believe, with Joe Gloria okay. and a number of other people. But yeah, um, the, the idea is that, that the UN expert on pri right to privacy will plan to meet Julian Assange on the 25th of April if he's still there. Um, and I believe a, a different minister, the expert on torture, um, has expressed alarm on the reports about WikiLeaks and specifically on the reports that Cassandra Fairbanks published about the highly surveilled room that Assange would enter in order to speak to a journalist and only after being body scanned and his lawyer being body scanned and all the rest. So, uh, so yeah, so I think that, uh, I think that um, this is obviously something to keep an eye on and to update our audience on. Uh, Susie's saying it says they've received assur assurances from the Ecuadorian government that uh, it will facilitate his visit. Um, I, I doubt, I really, I would have to say that I don't trust the Ecuadorian government to keep their word on I that don't, issue. Well, <laughs> I don't either, but, but this just, I mean, it just goes to show you this um, uh, backs up what we've been saying. When there's a tension, um, the fact that uh, um, uh, when he got that visit, that that got in the news, that these risks, these threats to have him removed get in the news, so this uh, rapporteur says it's going to show up April 25th. So they move it up. And I, I remember saying, so move it up. So go a few weeks early. Um, uh, I, I, it's all very, very important. And, uh, I, and I think that shows us, I think we can pat ourselves on the back. Um, uh, every time we um, uh, give attention to Julian's situation, uh, when WikiLeaks says something and the rest of us spread it, it's... Uh, it, it all adds up. And uh, I, I think it would have been, had it not been for efforts of your people like yourself and, and others who are more involved than I am, he would have been snatched already. So I think that um, it lets us know how important our work is and that we, you know, sometimes I feel like I, I haven't done enough, but I, I think together 
are all our efforts do count. And I think that's why he's safe at this point and will stay safe. And, you know, the Ecuadorian government, whatever it is they're uh, going through, they don't want the, obviously don't want the negative attention. And um, uh, they would rather not go through that. So, so they may, uh, the, the, you know, the president's involved in this scandal now. Um, and uh, so he may, it, it seems as though when this um, uh, story came out about his corruption, uh, that he, of course, it was a pretext to blame Julian. And he, I'm like, he, he hasn't had a phone or anything for a year, so he's not the one who did it. But, yeah, uh, exactly. but it, 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 it could be that. And it's like, I'm, I've had it. We're getting rid of him this, this week. Um, but uh, I think cooler heads prevail when there's pressure and they know yeah. it's not something that they can do e so easily. No, I, 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 just to your point, it's like, you know, Moreno of all people is more aware even than us because we aren't fully, mm -hmm. um, you know, informed on exactly the conditions at the embassy. So Moreno of all people knows just how uh, limited uh, Julian Assange is in his ability to, to, you know, he can't even access the internet. So, mm -hmm. so the idea that Moreno would really believe that Assange hacked him is absolutely ridiculous. And I don't know if you were watching earlier, but um, Jose Rivera, an Ecuadorian citizen um, in Ecuador at the moment, um, fear, speculated that uh, the one of the co-authors of the original article that uh, first commented on the scandal uh, had hacked some phones before, I believe, of, of uh, members of Rafael Correa's government. So it would be more likely that it was this... Um, you know, propagandist slash journalist um, who has been part of, uh, co-authored many anti-Assange pieces before and fabricated documents that that person could have been involved rather than, obviously, rather than Assange. But yeah, I, th I think mm -hmm. that that possibly the accusations from Moreno were off the cuff, but now that people, lots of different people, even some in the mainstream press have started to question those accusations because they are so patently absurd that th mm -hmm. that may have played into the Moreno government backing off a bit. Yeah, and uh, it's it's a and it's a good thing too. It's um, uh, it shows you they they do whatever deals they worked out, and you know they were told they were going to get money, and uh, it's so it's so horrible that Russia Gate where they said you know Paul Manafort visited him. No, he was dealing with you know we'll turn him over. Just you know what do you want and. Um, but uh, it's not easy for them. It's not so easy for them to do. And they've done this deal, but they can't really concentrate it at the, at the end of the day. Um, so uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of different wheels turning, but I think the bottom line is that this activism has, has helped, has helped him immensely. And, uh, um, but, uh, but we have to be ever vigilant and not let down our guard. Well, I think actually that should that type of statement should really activate and um, energize the audience that are listening, because that what you're saying really means that their voice, not just us, but their voices matter and the activism that they, um, you know, partake in does make an impact. And because I've seen so many people who do support Assange and WikiLeaks respond to bad news about about them by saying, what can I do? I feel so powerless. Like, I want to help, but I don't know how. And so what you're saying, those, those people need to hear your message that it's making a difference. You're not powerless. And um, we, uh, we shouldn't doubt ourselves so much and be so hard, uh, on, hard on ourselves. And I, I think we need to acknowledge the success we've had. He's still there. So we have been successful. We have done a lot because he's still, I mean, the most successful thing would, for, would be for him to be out of the embassy and out of legal jeopardy. But until that day, for him to uh, not fall into the hands of the, uh, of the U.S. government every day is a success. And um, uh, we, should, we, should definitely, we should definitely acknowledge that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think Ecuador has gone to extensive uh, lengths to kind of create, create a situation where the embassy right now is acting as a prison by proxy um, yeah. for the U.S. government. Yeah, they but. want and they want him to be as uncomfortable as possible, and uh, uh, I don't know. Hopefully, dry. I mean, he's not going to leave. Who the hell would leave? You know, um, but uh, they want to 
I, I suppose, try to make that, that happen, but it isn't going to happen. Uh, he's not going to leave uh, voluntarily. He would never do that. Um, but we know what we, we know what we have to do. We know it's worked. We know what has worked uh, thus far. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. I was just thinking about Russia Gate, and there are people, so many independent journalists who all along uh, cast doubt on this narrative, who all along uh, were, had various levels of skepticism. And uh, they've been proven right. And um, I, I think it shows that, uh, and they're getting more attention, more not you know, necessarily from all the places they should, but there's an acknowledgement that, um, that there were lies being told. And uh, um, so the fact that they're still here and the fact that there's now, I think, being heard by more people, there are people who can, I don't see anything wrong with saying, I told you so, or, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well, that reminds me that long. I'm sorry, I think it's very, very important after three years of, of this really, um, uh, you know, brutal propaganda, this very crude propaganda. Um, and uh, for, and, and they have gotten through, there are people who know that they should not believe everything they read. There are people who now know whose word they should doubt. And uh, I think that's a reason for optimism too, that we should not be pessimistic. Uh, even when things don't don't look so good, and because uh, there's vindication, there's vindication for them, and um, and that means they get a new hearing, and that means anything they say from now on, there is more and more uh, doubt. So uh, I think it's it's especially important that um, that we cast doubt on this, and that we defend defend Julian, defend everything he's done defend the fact that he's made these re revelations, defend Chelsea Manning and this persecution, uh, continued persecution of her is, um, is just vital. And because uh, we, do, we do reach new, new ears and eyes. Absolutely, and I think that brutal is the only word for the propaganda war that just, just on the Russiagate narrative that's ensued for the last few years, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, people like Caitlin Johnstone and yourself have all said, you know, this has been an abuse of the public, that this has been, I think, psyop or, or psychological warfare is the only word that could really sum it up other than maybe just brutal. But it's yeah, rough. it is. It's a funny thing. I was the other day, I, I noticed I'd seen this photograph before and it appeared in the Washington Post and the Associated Press. And it's a, supposed to be a photo from... Uh, Trump and Putin's uh, press conference in Helsinki. And it's obviously a manipulated photo. It's obviously a composite. And it, first of all, it shows Putin taller than Trump. And I said, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? And this has been accepted by corporate media. Suddenly Putin grew six or seven inches. I mean, it was crazy, but it's a sort of thing, it, you know, while it seemed laughable, Clearly it wasn't laughable to them. They realized the power of imagery. They realized the power of uh, um, uh, telling a lie with a, with a photograph and you know, making a short man tall to say, see, he's, you know, he's got it over Trump. He's, you know, he's taller than him. He's therefore, um, he's controlling him. Yeah, but the visual, even though that in a logical sense, that makes no sense, but visually it's, it's, it's accessing our emotions. It's trying to give us that visceral reaction. Of him yeah. controlling Trump. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but it's but now we know that that uh, uh, we know that much of what they've said was not true. Everybody may not be where we are, but I I think uh, this vindication can work in our favor on uh, Julian and Chelsea's uh, behalf, and uh, that we can um, uh, finally end this in the way the way that it should that it should end.
No, I think that's an extremely positive message and it's one that's really kind of refreshing to hear. And it's a validation that the work that everyone is doing, you know, whether it's us, whether it's the audience and their activism, that, that it matters and that it's significant. Um, Cause it, as an independent journalist, sometimes it does feel like you're screaming into the wind and that, you know, <laughs> nobody is hearing you except maybe people that you're preaching to that are the choir. So it can be, it can be rough. And I'm really glad that you have that positive. I know, message. I know. But then again, sometimes, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. I somebody recognized me on the subway. It was I was so funny. I was like, "How the hell do you know who I am?" I, anyway, I never met this person. So, and I, I tell this story to say that um, we have uh, more of an impact than than we know. And um, uh, I think the right people are are listening to us. And. Uh, you know, when when uh, Cassandra went to the embassy at all, that was an amazing thing to do. It was very important that she tell that story. And uh, that helped. And so, you know, to have people from UN Rapporteur say, well, I should go check it out. I should go meet him personally, see him face to face. So um, so that was a, an amazing thing for, for her to have done. And... Um, uh, so that should inspire us all to uh, to continue to act. And now I'm just I'm just thinking of some some things that uh, uh, new new things that um, that we might talk because I'm thinking about if I you know maybe there are religious leaders here who we could um, uh, inspire to actively speak up on uh, on his behalf. That as I said before, that still carries weight. And uh, it's something that uh, should not be overlooked as a, no, as a completely agree. And I think that not only would it be powerful as far as like the individual figures, maybe raising public awareness in general, but maybe those audiences that are part of their faith community may not be aware of this issue to the extent that we are, or maybe not be, they may not be aware of its importance. So having, having this sort of um, reporting and messaging spread to new audiences entirely, it, would be incredibly helpful and effective. Yeah, and I think that's something we sometimes forget that um, uh, everybody doesn't pay as much attention as, as we do. And uh, there are things we think people know and they, they just don't know. Um, they depend on the corporate media and they, you know, they skim a story and read the first, maybe read the first couple paragraphs and that's it. Well, how many of us have retweeted a story that has a good headline and not read it? I know I've yes. done that. You know, well, I try not to. I, <laughs> yeah, I try. I'm just saying I'm guilty of that sometimes. Yes, you know? I know. So, so um, you know, people aren't necessarily evil and, and stupid. Um, they just don't know. They're just unaware. And uh, but I, you know, my politics have changed over the years very much. And uh, so I'm an example and I of. Uh, uh, what can happen when we allow ourselves to be open uh, to people we might not have um, uh, been open to before and politics we might not have been open to before. So, um, so yeah, there's, uh, we have to be optimistic. I think there's, there's good reason for us. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great message too, because so often we see ourselves as on the side of good and therefore everyone who doesn't agree or hasn't been open-minded about it are on the side of wrong. And I think it is important for all of us to keep in mind that there are people who are, have good intentions, but as you say, are uninformed. And so speaking to them as if they're the enemy is not going to help no. in creating support for this, this issue. But I also don't like, as you're, as you're kind of alluding to, I don't blame the vast majority of people who are just uninformed because they have, you know, bills to pay and no time and three jobs and children to take care of. And so I don't know how the average citizen would ever keep themselves well informed if they only had a few minutes scrolling on their phone in traffic to yeah. look at news or headlines on Twitter, you know, so I can see why there's that, that you ignorance. Know, sometimes I, I keep that in mind and, you know, I will, it, it doesn't happen so much the last couple of weeks when people, when I would say, well, I, I, think that Russiagate is a lie and I get strange looks. And so now I've learned to preface my statement. I'll say, you know, I'm, I know you've never heard this before, but I seek out different sources. So this is why I say it. So I preface it, you know, try to soften the blow. So, you know, people might actually 
you know, listen to me. And and then we have to get off, sometimes get over our fear of speaking out. Nobody likes to stick out, you know, and be the only one saying something that's not comfortable. But um, the more you do it, the less alone you are um, eventually. So, yeah, no, human beings are such social animals and the fear of being shunned is something mm -hmm. that is a really deep seated, um, you know, uncomfortable, you know, thing that we have resistance to naturally. But um, I've heard it said before that, you know, how it is uncomfortable, but facing that mm -hmm. is the smallest thing we could possibly do when it, when you look at the discomfort of, of people like Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange, and they've given their entire lives for that truth and for the right of the public to know that truth. So facing that level of discomfort is something that you know, I think we can kind of commit ourselves to without feeling as if it's too much of a burden. Yeah, Hopefully. yeah, it's not. And it's like anything else, stick your toe in the water, you can do it. And then you'll, All next right. thing you know, you'll be walking down the street chanting something <laughs> with other people protesting something, or speaking up for something. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, uh, I think, uh, I think the glass is half full. Well, I'm really grateful to have your optimism because at this point, at this moment, you know, after the news we've had, while, you know, and I think that it is very easy to give in to pessimism and I myself am usually a sort of a pessimistic, I, I think of myself as a pessimistic realist, but I think having that that optimism um, and the, the validation, again, of the fact that this activism is making a difference is really helpful at a vigil like this. So. I, you know, I think we should just... Um... Uh, say to ourselves, we've, we've kept Julian safe thus far. And uh, so our actions, our actions do count. And uh, um, we have to, we have to remember that, that uh, there are people who matter, who are now paying attention. And, uh, you know, and it's difficult to figure out because you don't, you know, how do we know what's going on in Ecuador? So you you know, you're kind of guessing, how do you know what's going on in the UK and the Trump administration, forget them. They don't know what they're doing about anything. So uh, you, you never know, you know, the idea they thought they could overthrow the Venezuelan government. I mean, like, really? I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at. They can make life miserable for Venezuelans, but that's about it. Maduro's not going anywhere. So that's the kind of people we're dealing with who are um, unpredictable and, and stupid. So uh, that, that makes the, you know, this uh, business of, of trying to figure out what's, what's happening, it makes it, uh, makes it difficult. But we, but we do know the bottom line is the more we speak up, the safer he will be. Definitely. And uh, I guess we have about, about five minutes left in, mm -hmm. in this segment. Is there anything else that, that um, you know, related to this issue that, that we haven't covered that you'd like to discuss? I, you know, I just wanted to uh, to amplify the importance of of standing one's ground, and uh, I I know since the um, uh, the conclusions of the Miller Mueller report, I know the full report has not been released, but there's been a sea change uh, in favor of those who've been um, speaking out against the tide mostly for the past few years. And that does give me, it gives me hope that um, eyes can be open. Um, you know, when we think we're alone, we are not. And uh, uh, we're, we're not alone in this regard either. Uh, we just can't leave any stones unturned in um, um, defending and protecting uh, Julian Assange uh, because, uh, you know, his life depends on it, but it, it's, it's not just his life, it's all of us. Um, uh, the, the people behind this are very dangerous people and uh, snatching Julian is not even the worst thing they can do. These are people who want, who have made war, who wanna make more war, who plot and plan to, you know, sanction the country and starve people to death, they're horrible. And uh, um, we have to say that that's who they are. And uh, that can be difficult too, because people can be resistant to hearing negative things about their government. Um, but, uh, but we have to keep talking about, um, about who they are and uh, what, their, um, what their plans are for the world because they're not, they're not good. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Margaret, for joining us again. And I'm so glad that I got the chance to speak with you because I haven't nice before. To meet you. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you too. A shame that it's under these circumstances, but great to talk to you. And I know that you'll be back in future vigils um, I will. as they happen. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you. Time on a Friday. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.